Oh, so I'm gonna go on Facebook and share it. Hey guys, welcome back to Seller Sessions on a Sunday, Mindset Sunday. Again, Lee Rand returns. Today, we're going to be deconstructing Naval. Uh, Lee Rand will give you a little bit of background on Naval now. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to share my screen and we're going to start by showing you the tweet storm and it'll go into, uh, into a bit of detail on why we're so impressed by this guy and this is where we're going to sit down and start to pick about his mindset and what he is about so over to yes. you Lee, man, while i share to the groups yes uh so naval um naval kind of goes by the name of the angel philosopher and the reason why angel is because um naval is actually uh an investor um, an, an angel investor he actually founded the company called angelist which I think connected uh, companies that were looking for angel investors, I, I think with investors and services that they that they needed. But essentially, he's kind of an interesting guy because he's this Silicon Valley investor, super smart and successful. Uh, and at the same time, he's also this like thinker philosopher, um, which is a very interesting combination. So he's built up this, this big following. Um, I was introduced to like his work and his following last year. There's a great episode if you uh, if you want to watch. There's a great episode of Naval and Joe Rogan, um, which is which is really really good. I highly recommend if you want to get a feel. Um, he he also has his own podcast, which will which we'll, we're going to talk about, and um, you should look up um, you should look up the Naval podcast. Um, he's got that. He's got another podcast called Spearhead, which is all about investing. But um, he's got one giant episode. You look up from sometime at the end of last year where he went through this entire tweet storm. So he got really kind of famous um, when he put up in 2018, this, what, what he called the tweet storm, which is like all these life principles um, that he has. Um, and that kind of went viral. And from that tweet storm, you know, he created podcast episodes around it. There's one giant podcast episode from last year where he go through, he goes through all the concepts. It's like a three hour episode. Um, highly recommend you listen to that. Um, and, um, you know, start getting into Naval if you haven't, because his his uh, thinking is is uh, very enlightening. Indeed. So what we're going to do, we'll mix it up a little bit. I'm going to play some. I'm going to go ghetto with this. We're going to play the audio down the microphone. It's the best way to play back. Yeah. And then Lee Ram and I will pick us pick it apart. Um, but we'll go through some of the other parts of the tweet storm a bit later. But I think it's important that you hear his voice and and rather than just reading the tweet storm, is under understand the context of what he's saying behind it. So just yep. want to say a couple of hot hellos. Hey, gents from Elchin. Andrew's here. Epic sounds promising. Uh, Rashish is here. Angelist got me my first job. Excellent. Ah. Uh, love L L Naval. Patricia says, morning. Tiffany says, what's up, guys? Owen saying, hi. Let's have a look in the feed. Dave's here as well. Marvin is here. Sophia and, is joined us. Sorry, go on, Lee Ren. Yeah, and by the way, Naval, Naval Ravengrat, he's got a brother who is Kamal Ravengrat, who's also quite an interesting guy, yeah. um, who is also an investor, um, and wrote the book, uh, wrote a book called Love Your Life, Love Yourself Like Your lo Life Depends On It. Mm -hmm. um, amazing book. Highly, highly recommend you read that book. Um, he was on the uh, his business at one point totally failed. He was on the verge of suicide. Um, and kind of, uh, the book is about like how he pulled himself out of it. Um, really, really smart guy. Follow him. Uh, you, you should read that book. Uh, if you have, uh, if you want to, if you want a new book, um, excellent. Uh, and Tiffany writes that book is life changing. Yeah. So awesome book. So that book came out years ago. And then last year, I think he did a sort of like addition to the book. Um, and it became like, again, a number one, like uh, new bestseller because he made an addition to the book. So I read the book in January. Um, uh, amazing book. And he gives his email on the book and I emailed him and kind of went back and forth um, on some uh, on some emails with the guy. So uh, super cool. Unlike his brother who doesn't like doing coffees, which we'll get into. Yes. Yes. All right. Are we ready to go? First ones first. Let's just kick it off with yep. Seek Wealth, Not Money or Status. Let me go. Guys, just give me a thumbs up in the feed. If you can hear this, okay. Angelist of Naval, and I also co-authored the Venture Hacks blog with him back in the day. Yeah, the How to Get Niche Tweet Storm definitely hit a nerve. A lot of people say it was helpful, reach across aisles, and people outside of the tech industry, people in all walks of life, people do want to know how to solve their money problems. And everyone vaguely knows that they want to be wealthy, but they don't have a good set of principles to do it by. 
What's the difference between wealth, money, and status? Wealth is the thing that you really want. Wealth is assets that earn while you sleep. Wealth is the factory that the robots is cranking out things. Wealth is the computer program that's running at night that's serving other customers. Wealth is even money in the bank that is being reinvested into other assets and into other businesses. Even a house can be a form of wealth because you can rent it out, although that's probably a lower use of productivity of land than actually doing some commercial enterprise. So my definition of wealth is much more businesses and assets that can earn while you sleep. But really the reason you want wealth is because it buys you freedom. So you don't have to wear a tie like a collar around your neck. So you don't have to wake up at 7 a.m. and rush to work and sit in commute traffic. So you don't have to waste away your entire life grinding all the productive hours into a way to a soulless job that doesn't fulfill you. So the purpose of wealth is freedom. It's nothing more than that. It's not to buy fur coats or drive Ferraris or sail yachts. But we'll come back to that. So, Lee Rand, just break down that first part there, what you're saying. It's, it's just summarizing a lot of people try and look for the end of the rainbow pot. Right. And, that, and that's riches, having physical money. But wealth right. is, doesn't matter how much money you, you have, right. it's where you can live by. You can go and live in the third world country and be wealthy on right. a low amount of money that you couldn't even rent a, an apartment for in a small place in New York, right? Yes. Yeah, so what, what he's saying is that instead of having, instead of seeking money, seek wealth, right? So the difference is that somebody can seek money by saying, hey, I want to make, you know, 200,000 a year. Or I want to make 100,000 a year. Or I want to make X amount of money. But instead, you should seek to build assets that can produce things for you without you having to, without, without you having to trade that time for money kind of a thing, right? So, it, so seeking wealth would be, like he says, buying a building where people have offices that pays you rent, right? Because that's wealth. That that building creates wealth for you. Or investments in companies. He's he's a big angel investor, right? So he puts his money behind founders and behind behind companies, and he's putting that creates wealth, right? Like if he if he was an early investor in Uber, um, and he made some smart decisions, he didn't actually need to go work work behind work at uber but he was able to create wealth through that investment and so that's kind of that's kind of what he's saying and, and then he's saying don't seek status and one of the reasons he talks about not seeking status is because status is a he talks he talks in another episode about a zero sum game or there's another word or, or we'll, we'll uh, come to that one yeah yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll come to that. but 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 in order to have status you have to be like higher than somebody else so he says just seek wealth because wealth is not a is not a zero sum game. It's something. It's something actually everybody can have. Um, so seek assets is kind of what he's saying over just money. And one of the other things that people make a mistake of is they go, "Well, I own my house. Your house, mm -hmm. if you live in it, is a liability." Yeah, because yep. it's not making money. You're using that property there. So although the you know a compound over time, you pay your mortgage off, and it will increase hopefully in value and everything. Ultimately, owning the property that you live in is a liability, not an asset. Yep. That's very much in line with like, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, right? Rich dad, poor dad, who says like, yeah, your house is actually like, if something is not producing cash flow, it's, you know, it's not really like an asset. Now, you can always sell your house in the future. It can always rent it out. So it's got that potential, which is why it kind of says like your house could be wealth, but mm. that's really only if you're renting it out. Cool. Right. Making money isn't about luck. Let's do that one. Um, making money, Obviously, we want to be wealthy and we want to get there in this lifetime without having to rely on luck. A lot of people think making money is about luck. It's not, it's about becoming the kind of person that makes money. You know, I like to think that if I lost all my money and if you drop me on a random street in any English speaking country within five, 10 years, I'd be wealthy again, <laughs> right? Because it's just a skill set that I've developed and I think anyone can develop. You know, in a thousand parallel universes, you want to be wealthy in 999 of them. You don't want to be wealthy in the 50 of them where you got lucky. So we want to factor luck out of it. There's really four kinds of luck that we were talking about. This came from a book, P. Mark, uh, Mark Andreessen wrote a blog post about it. But basically, there's different kinds of luck. The first kind of luck you might just say is like blind luck, where I just got lucky because something completely out of my control happened. You know, that's fortune, that's fate, etc. Then there's luck that kind of comes through persistence, hard work, hustle, motion, which is when you're just running around creating lots of opportunities 
you're generating a lot of energy, you're doing a lot of things, lots of things will just get stirred up in the dust. It's almost like mixing a, a Petri dish and seeing what combines or, or mixing a bunch of reagents and seeing what combines. You're just generating enough force and hustle and energy that luck will sort of find you. We as a group, you could argue, got together because of that. You know, Nenad had put up these great videos online. I saw them on Twitter. And so in that sense, he sort of generated his own luck by just creating videos until people like me keep finding him. A third way is that you just become very good at spotting luck. So if you are very skilled in a field, you will notice when a lucky break happens in that field when other people who aren't attuned to it won't notice. So you become sensitive to luck and that's through skill and knowledge and work. And then the last kind of luck is the weirdest, hardest kind, but that's what we want to talk about, which is where you build a unique character, a unique brand, a unique mindset where then luck finds you. For example, let's say that you're the best person in the world at deep sea underwater diving and you're known to like take on deep sea underwater dives that nobody else will even attempt to dare. And then by sheer luck, somebody finds a sunken treasure ship off the coast they can't get at. Well, their luck. Yeah. So breaking that down for yeah. four main kind of luck there. Yeah. So just to, to start with that last one, right? That last, the last one is the person put himself in position where now that they needed to go find, find now that they needed to go like, get this money they're going to contact that person who's put themselves in position to go get to go get the money and he's going to get you know half he's going to get half the wealth or whatever right for going um uh and trying to help out doing that so that's where all of us want to get to you know the first place is like you know lottery winners right lottery winners tend to lose all their money yeah. um and actually become poor again and that's because uh wealth is the mindset right like how do they go from having winning millions of dollars to most lottery winners losing it or talking about you know most nfl football players Six become years. bankrupt become yeah. bankrupt after their career because they never really they never really had the right the right mindset in the, in the first place with the so, financial education so it wasn't bread it goes back yeah. to the rich dad poor dad and it's the same for me yeah. like i didn't i had to learn financial education as i yeah. got older which i i try and teach my 14 year old daughter now which is yeah. again like you yeah. said it's a mindset but if you've not been given that education a lot happens with working class people you give them a bunch of money the people around them want that money as well and then what happens is that person feels tortured by having all this money they've got no financial education everyone's standing right. there with their hands out wait for an end handout right then suddenly right. what they're doing is they're chasing that money away they don't want that money around them because right. it becomes poisonous to them so they right. spend it it becomes frivolous and they give it away and then in the end they actually feel partly relieved to relieve themselves for that money <laughs> right and then also gutted because they're now gone back to being broke and it goes back to that yeah. mindset is that those people that go out and do the the lottery each week which literally is they're like their their mindset is that if i win the lottery that solves their problem but as we know right. what naval says it doesn't solve their problems it right. only solves their money problems right so the question to ask yourself is who do i need to be in order what kind of person do i need to become in order to put myself in position to get to stage 4 i think it's okay to start out with like you said, stage two, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you know, if you're if you just finished school and you're starting out in life, you're gonna probably create a bunch of different, like you're gonna try to create a bunch of different opportunities or a bunch of different things, which is I think is a great way to start. And then along the way, you're gonna build up that knowledge. You're gonna you're gonna hopefully put yourself in a position to get to um, to get to number three, which is like you get to so you finish college, you get to you 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 maybe start a few different businesses, right? You try to create different things one thing hits right you've created enough you've generated enough opportunity for one thing to hit now you get very deep specific knowledge in that field where you can see the opportunity ahead of other people and then become potentially an expert in that field to put yourself in a position for people to come to you um right it it's very much in the sense um danny to you know not to not to toot our horn but like for you and I who are in this space of Amazon, right? We've positioned ourselves as experts, right? Mm. For whatever that means, right? There's yeah, probably- I still, I, still, I still consider myself a, a student of the game, but then I've been doing it yeah. since 2015 and I live it daily, yeah? Yeah, now there's probably people, there's many people out there hmm. that are 
more knowledgeable, more yeah. successful, do yeah, better yeah. than us, except yeah. they haven't put them out, they haven't put themselves out there. So we have, yeah. right? Yeah. But but for both of us, that has created opportunity, right? We've put mm -hmm. ourselves in a position of expertise to create opportunity, mm -hmm. right? We we've kind of done some of what he's talking about. Again, not saying you and I are the end all be all. There's plenty of people selling 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars mm -hmm. who are way more skilled, but they just haven't yeah. put themselves out there. So they haven't, yeah. they haven't gone after the same thing. But it's kind of an example of putting yourself in a position to get lucky because now I'm sure you've had it. I've had it. People come to you with opportunities, right? Yeah. Some some suck and some don't suck, but you've put yourself in a position. And that's kind of what you want to you want to you want to get to the point where you have that. That's a good point to get to where you yeah. have that that opportunity instead of just getting lucky. But I think starting out stirring a lot of shit up hmm. like like how a lot of us got started right in online marketing or whatever like you probably tried other stuff you did affiliate stuff or no, i didn't stuff. do affiliates but I, I launched loads of little micro business service-based business that failed but then exactly you, you only you only have to get it right once so you stirred enough shit up to make yeah. something happen right which was kind of yeah. like yeah. and then you got into amazon which you, you got like some specific knowledge right and then you yeah. put yourself in a position to get lucky yeah. um it's all the steps he's talking about that's really what you want to get to yeah should we get to the next one yes so let's go to the next one which is oh i won't go because we kind of covered that make luck your destiny we just kind of just uh chatted about that but mm -hmm. i tell you what this is a good one trust they're not going to trust you Okay. Also indecision so, think about working in what kind of job play should... play long term games oh, yeah. with long with long term people uh, and who you might want to work with. So you said one should pick an industry where you can play long term games with long term people. Why? Yeah, this is an insight into what makes Silicon Valley work and what makes high trust societies work. Essentially, all the benefits in life come from compound interests, whether it's in relationships or making money or in learning. So compound interest is a marvelous force where it's like, you know, you start out with one X what you have. And then if you increase 20% a year for 30 years, it's not that you got 30 years times 20% added on. It was compounding. So it just grew and grew and grew until you suddenly got a massive amount of whatever it is, whether it's goodwill or love or relationships or money. So I think compound interest is a very important force. You have to be able to play a long-term game. And long-term games are good not just for compound interest, they're also good for trust. If you look at prisoner's dilemma type games, the solution to prisoner's dilemma is tit for tat, which is I'm just going to do to you what you did last time to me with some forgiveness in case there was a mistake made. But that only works in an iterated prisoner's dilemma. In other words, if we play the game multiple times. So if you're in a situation, like for example, you're in Silicon Valley, where people are doing business with each other and they know each other, they trust each other, then they do right by each other because they know this person will be around for the next game. Now, of course, that doesn't always work because you can make so much money in one move in Silicon Valley. Sometimes people betray each other because they're just like, I'm going to get rich enough of this that I don't care. So there can be exceptions to all these circumstances. But essentially, if you want to be successful, you have to work with other people and you have to figure out who can you trust and who can you trust over a long, long period of time that you can just keep playing the game with them so that compound interest and high trust will make it easier to play the game and will let you collect the major rewards, which are usually at the end of the cycle. So, for example, Warren Buffett has done really well as an investor in the U.S. stock market. But the biggest reason he could do that was because the U.S. stock market has been stable and around and didn't get, for example, seized by the government during a bad administration or the U.S. didn't plunge into some war. The underlying platform didn't get destroyed. So in his case, he was playing a long-term game, and the trust came from the U.S. stock market stability. In Silicon Valley, the trust comes from the network of people in the small geographic area that you figure out over time who you can work with and who you can't. If you keep switching locations, you keep switching groups. Let's say you started out in the woodworking industry. And you build up a network there and you're working hard. You're trying to build a product in the woodworking industry. And then suddenly another industry comes along that's adjacent but different, but you don't really know anybody in it and you want to dive in and make money there. If you keep hopping from industry, to, no, actually, I need to open a line of electric car stations for electric car refueling. That might make sense. It might be the best opportunity. But every time you reset, every time you wander out of where you built your network, you're going to be starting from scratch. You're not going to know who to trust. They're not going to trust you. There are also industries in which people are... Okay, two things there, right? Trust and industry switching and your age. 
Yes. If you add all those in, like you was in an industry, I was in the music industry originally, they went into tech and then here, I'm 44. This is my third turn, mm -hmm. effectively. Yep. How many more turns do I have? Right. Because age is going to catch up, right? Right. Yeah. How am I going to build a network again? And this is, goes for the same people, everything we're talking about. So let, let's get your thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I love this concept. It's very easy to understand long-term gains with long-term people. Yeah. Um, that means, you know, you, that means you want to do the right thing by other people and you're looking for the other, you're looking for those similar, similar types of people. Uh, Silicon Valley, you know, it's there. It's not surprising that you can have somebody that's just like can make 10 phone calls and can raise $20 million because they've already played this game with other people, mm -hmm. right? Before, maybe they've had a, a win or an investment together and now everyone's going to be on board for the next thing because they've had five years of history doing something else together where they probably had opportunities to do the right thing or not do the right thing and they did the right thing. So the concept to me works very well. It works very well in business too. If you want to be in your business serving a customer, right? Whether that's, you know, in your Amazon business or off Amazon or in any business, you if you want to be in business long term, you want to do the right thing by your by your customer, right? And not get a bad reputation and not get bad reviews and, and not not do all these things. So, you know, one of the other uh, one of the other things he talks about is that being ethical is actually also good for long term business. It's the same mm -hmm. concept here. Being ethical with other people is actually going to make you more profitable and more successful long -term. Um, in the long term. Now, he's, now, of course, he said there's exceptions, right? Sometimes there might be a deal where you could screw somebody over in Silicon Valley. And you make so much money, you don't necessarily care. But, you know, I guess, you know, learn, hearing from here from him, it's why Silicon Valley works so well, why it's so concentrated in the San Francisco Bay Area is like everybody knows everybody there. And if one guy screwed somebody else on stuff, you find out very quickly. So hmm. it's a high trust thing. You know, I, um, at one point in my career for six months, I worked for my ex-wife's family was in the diamond business and I worked in diamond business and in the diamond business, you literally handed somebody a million dollars worth of diamonds on a handshake and, and why it's very much concentrated on 47th street in the diamond district in Manhattan. Hmm. Everybody knows everybody. If yeah. you screw somebody over, you're finished, right? For, for life in your career. So it's, it's, it's another one of those areas that's very high trust um, and you should seek out those people that you can really think about is this is this somebody I want to play long-term games with mm. um, yeah. so that's the, the, it's the funny concept. you should say that because one of my investors back in the day of a startup that we did is um, was is Hatton Garden in London Hatton Garden is a gold district he was in gold yeah. refinery as well and I'm not saying a million pounds worth were on a handshake like you with the diamonds but obviously there was relationships with all the that that like you know i don't know, quarter of a mile circumference where there are all those shops and stuff around there you you if you showed your face around there uh, you, and you done something wrong you couldn't show your face again it's just like we're right. the same but it's they're obviously working with big numbers there um yep. okay let's get into does anyone in the feed have any questions let us know if you've got any questions uh, I don't because it's a little bit quiet out there on the uh, on the feed side of things. Hope the uh, everyone's enjoying this. Uh, here we go. What about this one? Pick partners with intelligence, energy, and integrity. So build yep. on what we just said. Yeah. And then um, Danny, another one we should you should run is uh, he talks about leverage. And I think yes, that's re really powerful. Yeah. Let's get to that one in a sec. That someone else is stupid, but it's more that everyone's smart at different okay. things. So depending on what you want to oh, do well, you find, in terms of pick people to work with that have high intelligence, high energy, and high integrity. I find that's the three-part checklist that you cannot compromise on. You need someone who's smart or they're heading in the wrong direction and you're not going to end up in the right place. You need someone high energy because the world is full of smart, lazy people. We all know people in our lives who are really smart, but you know can't get out of bed or lift a finger. And we also know people who are very high energy, but not that smart. So they work hard, but they're sort of running in the wrong direction. And smart, it's not a pejorative. It's not meant to be like, Someone's smart, someone else is stupid, but it's more that everyone's smart at different things. So depending on what you want to do well, you have to find someone who's smart at that thing. And then energy, a lot of times people are unmotivated for a specific thing, but they're not motivated for other things. So for example, someone might be really unmotivated to go to a job and sit in an office, but they might be really motivated to go paint, right? Well, in that case, they should be a painter. They should be putting art up on the internet, trying to figure out how to build a career out of that, rather than wearing a collar around their neck and going to a dreary job. And then 
high integrity is the most important because otherwise if you've got the other two, what you have is you have a smart and hardworking crook who's eventually going to cheat you. So you have to figure out if the person's high integrity. And as we talked about, the way you do that is through signals and signals is what they do, not what they say. It's all the nonverbal stuff that mm. people do Action. when they think nobody's looking. Yeah. With respect to... Cool. That kind of covers yeah. everything. Can it, let's go yeah, into that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so so important to you know work work with the right people, and like he said, that criteria of high in, high intelligence, high energy, high, integ high integrity, yeah, and integrity obviously being being the most important one. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, if you're gonna if you're going to, you know, it's sort of any any relationship. I mean, this could be, but most importantly, I think this is in your in your business business relationships and partnerships like hmm. these, these three should be should be non-negotiables uh and especially high integrity but let's have, let's pick it apart how you get there because it's very easy to meet someone who's charming and all that kind of stuff you've got to set the the tone for when these people are allowed to either join your business you join forces with them it's like where do you find them in the relationship cycle and who are these people that's very key in terms of who you do business with yeah i mean i think you know i think it's best not to jump into bed like immediately and let some time play out and get to know the person and um you know i've i think made the mistakes of jumping into bed too quickly mm -hmm. um and being you know too trusting um uh, uh i i think you i think you want to i think you want to go slow mm -hmm. and uh go slow and like date before you get married um and see the person and you know like they say if you're gonna marry someone right get them angry right and but see how they react right <laughs> like, like see how they react right like get them angry see how they see how they react uh it's kind of the same thing and it's kind of the same thing in business right it's like mm -hmm. very if everything's going great, like it's very easy, but like when shit hits the fan, when things go tough, what's the reaction like? Are they blaming you? All right, you know, what are things like? So I think it's important to date, get to know someone, do your homework. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, you know, the initial excitement of potentially, like, I'll give you an example, actually. Somebody asked me the other day, I said, hey, this woman wants to partner with me in, in an Amazon business. And like this person's mm -hmm. like an Amazon expert. Okay. And the, the woman isn't right. And I'm like, and she's, I'm like, well, what's the deal? She's like, well, we're each going to put 50, 50 of the money and we're going to launch a product. Right. And I'm like, you're the expert. You're going to do everything. What is, what's your upside? Like, why do you, why do you, why do you need them? Right. Like sometimes like, meaning if this person was putting up all the money and then you're the expert, like, okay, I can see how that yeah. deal should, should work. Right. And then there's some kind of equity, equity split. But like, think about it. what is what is my upside, um, and I find writing things down like pros and cons, right? Like, mm -hmm. what are the benefits of this partnership? What are the benefits of this person? What are the potential downsides? Like, really, really think things through. Uh, I think will lead to better uh, better decisions. And uh, hey, Jason, Jason and I are in a in another group called Build Your Life Resume. Uh, mm -hmm. It's um, Jesse Itzler's course, and it's a, a alumni group, and uh, really, really, really good. So I get to see Jason. In all the Amazon related stuff, and then I get to see him in the in the life stuff, which is cool. Okay, what was the what was the one that you wanted about yeah, leverage? Yeah, there's a really good one on on where he talks about leverage because I think it's super relevant to like labor and ca capital are old leverage. Is that yeah. one or product yeah. and media or new leverage? Both. Should we do both? Really, but... we do both? Okay, yeah. let's do that. So why don't we talk a little bit about leverage? The first tweet in the storm was a famous quote from Archimedes, which was, give me a lever long enough and a place to stand and I will move the earth. The next tweet was, fortunes require leverage. Business leverage comes from capital, people, and products with no marginal cost of replication. Leverage is critical. The reason I stuck an Archimedes quote in there is... Normally, I don't like putting other people's quotes in my Twitter. Like, that doesn't <laughs> add any value. You can go look up those people's quotes. But this quote I had to put in there because it's just so fundamental. I read it when I was very, very young, and it had a huge impression on me. And we all know what leverage is when we use a seesaw or a lever. We understand how that works physically. But I think what our brains aren't really well evolved to comprehend is how much leverage is possible in modern society and what the newest forms of leverage are. And so the oldest form of leverage is labor, which is people working for you. 
So instead of me lifting rocks, I can have 10 people lift rocks. And just by my guidance on where the rocks should go, a lot more rocks get moved than I could do myself. Everybody understands this because we're evolved to understand the labor form of leverage. And so what happens is society overvalues labor as a form of leverage. This is why your parents are impressed when you get a promotion and you have lots of people working underneath you. This is why when a lot of naive people, when you tell them about your company, they'll say, how many people work there? They'll use that as a way to establish credibility. They're trying to measure how much leverage and impact you actually have. Or when someone starts a movement, they'll say how many people they have or how big the army is. We just automatically assume that more people is better. But I would argue that this is the worst form of leverage that you could possibly use. Managing other people is incredibly messy. It requires tremendous leadership skills. You're one short hop from a mutiny or getting eaten or torn apart by the mob. It's incredibly competed over. Entire civilizations have been destroyed over this fight. For example, communism, Marxism is all about the battle between capital and labor, das Kapital and das Labor, right? So it's kind of a trap. So you really want to stay out of labor-based leverage. You want the minimum amount of people working with you that are going to allow you to use the other forms of leverage, which I would argue are much more interesting. The second type of leverage is capital. And this one's a little less hardwired into us because large amounts of money moving around and being saved and being invested in money markets, these are inventions of human beings the last few hundred to few thousand years. They're not evolve with us from hundreds of thousands of years. So we understand them a little bit less well. They probably require more intelligence to use correctly. And the ways in which we use them keep changing. Management skills from 100 years ago might still apply today, but investing in the stock market skills from 100 years ago probably don't apply to the same level today. So capital is a trickier form of leverage to use. It's more modern. It's the one that people have used to get fabulously wealthy in the last century. It's probably been the dominant form of leverage in the last century. And you can see this by who are the richest people. It's bankers, politicians in corrupt countries who print money, essentially people who move large amounts of money around. And if you look at the top of very large companies, outside of technology companies, in many, many large old companies, the CEO job is really a financial job. They're really financial asset managers. Now, sometimes an asset manager can put a pleasant face on it so you get a Warren Buffett type. But deep down, I think we all dislike capital as a form of leverage because it feels unfair because it's this invisible thing that can be accumulated and passed across generations and suddenly seems to result in people having gargantuous amounts of money with nobody else kind of around them or necessarily sharing in it. That said, capital is a powerful form of leverage. It can be converted to labor. It can be converted to other things. It's very surgical, very analytical. If you are a brilliant investor and you have a billion dollars and you can make a 30% return with it, where anybody else can only make a 20% return, you're going to get all the money and you're going to get paid very handsomely for it. It scales very, very well. If you get good at managing capital, you can manage more and more capital much more easily. You can manage more and more people. So it is a good form of leverage, but the hard part with capital is how do you obtain it? And that's why I talked about specific knowledge and accountability first. If you have specific knowledge in a domain, and if you're accountable and you have a good name in that domain, then people are going to give you capital as a form of leverage that you can use to then go get more capital. So the capital. Yeah. yeah. So, so now, you know, in his, so he talks about leverage, right? And in his second, uh, second, um, podcast about leverage. So, so, so that's okay. So let's kind of go back. Leverage is uh, utilizing Amazon FBA, right? That's just coming left. Sorry. Yeah, go. No problem. Yeah. So, so Amazon FBA, right? The best hmm. example of leverage that all of us use is, you know, starting an Amazon business as a one man show, hmm. sending your stuff to Amazon and using the leverage that's that's there, which is which is essentially ca both capital and labor leverage, right? Like mm. you're spending money to have Amazon do this stuff. Amazon has all the all these employees, right? So the the old forms of leverage are capital and labor, money, money and people. Yeah. In his in his next clip, there he talks about the new forms of leverage. Let's um, do that. Where, yeah. Let's play. Yeah, let's play that. And then we can pick both of them part together because yeah. it makes sense to bring the two yeah. into play. So the most interesting and the most important form of leverage is this idea of products that have no marginal cost of replication. 
this is the new form of leverage. This was only invented in the last few hundred years. It got started with the printing press. It accelerated broadcast media. And now it's really blown up with the internet and with code. So now you can multiply your efforts without having to involve other humans and without needing money from other humans. This podcast is a form of leverage. Long ago, I would have had to sit in a lecture hall and lecture each of you personally, and I would have maybe reached a few hundred people, and that would have been that. 30 years ago, I would have to be lucky to get on TV, which is somebody else's leverage. They would have distorted the message. They would have taken the economics out of it or charged me for it. They would have muddled the message, and I would have been lucky to get that form of leverage. But today, thanks to the internet, I can buy a cheap microphone, hook it up to a laptop or an iPad, and there you are, all listening. So this newest form of leverage is where all the new fortunes are made. So all the new billionaires, so the last generation fortunes were made by capital. That was the Warren Buffetts of the world. But the new generation fortunes are all made through code or media. Joe Rogan making 50 to 100 million bucks a year from his podcast. PewDiePie. I don't know how much money he's rolling in, but he's bigger than the news, right? The Fortnite players. Of course, Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg and Larry Page and Sergey Brin and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. That is all code-based leverage. Now, the beauty is when you combine all of these three, that's where tech startups really excel, where you take just the minimum but highest output labor that you can get, which are engineers and designers, product developers, and then you add in capital. You use that for marketing, advertising, scaling. And you add in lots of code and media and podcasts and content to get it all out there. That is a magic combination. And that's why you see technology startups explode out of nowhere, use massive leverage and just make huge outsized returns. Do you want to talk? Cool. Can I kick this one off? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I so, mean, it's, uh, yeah, you said, can you kick it off? Yeah. So I just did oh, yeah. to revert back to the podcast thing. In 2015, yeah. 16, we were doing. Uh, meetup groups around London. Lots mm -hmm. of effort, lots of work to be put into them. You get between 100 and 160 people. We st we started the model of free pizza, free booze, get a sponsor in, free education, everything else. We got to the point where all of our events were banged out. They was heaving. And then we'd add a new night, a second night, and a third night. And it got to the stages where everyone got signed up really early. And then when we got over a summer period, we put three on in a row, which means we had to get the um, sponsorship money three times over to pay for everything again. And then the, there was a time when the second and the third night was nearly empty. And this is because people were signing up early, but they're not showing up because there was no meat on the bone as why they should turn up and because i haven't paid for a ticket there was no value proposition right. behind it for them to leave in the heat in the summer to get on a train or a bus or whatever to turn up but equally mm -hmm. when even you sent e emails out to them said please if you're not going to come let us know and then what i done from there i looked at that and i thought what's the point i'm doing all this work with other people we're knocking our cods out on a monthly basis to put all this together why not do a podcast and and have the opportunity to reach not hundreds but thousands and on a weekly basis. And so that right. was one of my my leverages, which I'd done was the switch from doing the meetup to the podcast. It's like it's yep. the same with the speaking. You know, you can reach people, but then if that, that speaking work then goes on to a summit or it's then syndicated, it, it reaches out further. There becomes your leverage. So go on. That was my Yeah, point. I mean it's 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 insane. I mean, I, I look at like, you know, uh, on Instagram, you know, I go this past week, like uh A Rod Alex Rodriguez. Um, famous in the U.S., ba uh, former Yankee baseball player. Now he's doing a lot in business. He goes on Instagram live with somebody else, and they have two thousand people watching. Mm -hmm. Right, more than you could fill up in in a room within within two minutes of going live. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. So so yeah, I mean this new form of leverage. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry Bless about you. that. Uh, thank you. This this new form of leverage where anyone any one of us can get on a mic. Put out a put out a podcast. Go on YouTube. Go use the internet. Right. Build a web page. Like that's all leverage. That's the new form of leverage where you can get in front of you know social media. Like right. That's all leverage where you can get in front of so many people uh, yeah. with your with your business with your idea utilizing for very very low cost. Right. So new form of leverage. And then he talks about yeah combining this with you know code plus capital plus labor. Right all together plus media right all these old forms plus new forms of of uh of leverage is just tremendous and you know i'm i'm having a i'm having a delivery of food 
hear mm -hmm. in a little bit from Instacart, right? An app, right? That they're they're just using leverage, right? They're getting out there with code. They have some shoppers, which are very low cost, low cost labor. Yeah. Um, so lo low cost labor combined with code, and boom, you have you have a business. Um, exactly. So that is the new new form of leverage. Just you know, it's available to a lot more people today than just capital. Yeah, it's the same with like with our agency. I mean, there's there's plenty of agencies in the space. I would never have touched it unless Ellis walked into my life. I've been doing PPC since 2008. It's a competitive right. area. You've gone into it. Everyone's gone into it. And we've got great yep. relationships with a lot of people. You've seen that from yep. PPC Congress. It's, it's weird. Mm -hmm. It's like a big loving of all these agencies that generally get yep. on 99% of them, right? But mm -hmm. one thing I, I did think about, and one of the designs I wanted to put in place for the agency is reduction of headcount in terms of the amount of accounts that manage per head without affecting the quality of the business, which comes through code. It comes through mm -hmm. engineering. And now we've structured the business. We slowly grew the business because we wanted to know our touch points of scale. We wanted to make sure is that I know agencies out there that might have, say, 70 clients. So they've got more than us, but they've got like 30 staff. And it's like when you added that up, it's like just over two people per account. It didn't, it doesn't make sense. Do you know what I mean? Especially yep. we come to times like this where some people may be effective, they've been furloughed in their jobs and stuff. You want to be able to create a buffer there and look at the permissions of scale. One of the things I was going to do, wireless was still developing code. There was plenty of time on my hands to do stuff. I almost launched an agency, a full bodied agency where we managed accounts. But then when I done all the numbers and I looked at the labor time and everything else, and what, right. I'm just thinking the human capital costs, when yep. you look at the agency of the PPC agency versus managing accounts, yep. let's look at what the benefits of managing accounts are, right? So right. You, you're going to, there's the, there's the launching of products, right? So that's a specialized area. There's the PPC, yep. which is created part of the visibility as well. Then you've got customer support. And then how often are you going to optimize these listings? You don't do them weekly, do you? Right. Or monthly. They're done at the very beginning right. and then you optimize, blah, blah. So when you look at like account management, what is really involved? Because you're not managing the factory partnerships. You're not shipping the products right. in. You take over when they hit Amazon. So when you look at what you're managing, a lot of that I see is that it's a lot of paper trail where someone will contact you and say, have you done this? Nope. And then they'll do an email back. I've done that now. So what you have is your partner is chasing you to find out if you've done this. And you might have interaction with your client all day, every day, or multiple clients. And therefore, that's why you need quite a large team in, in a lot yeah. of cases, to, even with yeah. great processes in place. So I do think it's important, like you said, is you've got to look at where these points of scale are and what you're you know, the human capital costs, your overheads and everything else is really important. And you've got to say, take some time to think about it. Now, a lot of people will say to you, go and scale and then trim the fat. But then that's an after effect because you sign too many clients, you don't look after them, you get a churn rate. Right. So there's yep. always something to balance off with, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think leveraging, I think leveraging, and one of, one of the things he talks about further or at some point is that, it's like, okay, if you don't know how to code, hmm. like, that's fine. Go yeah. leverage media, right? Go yeah. leverage YouTube. Go leverage podcasts. Like, there's no yeah. coding involved there. And that's all things you can do in a business to to, to scale. You could do that. There are people who have e-commerce businesses that have podcasts. I follow this. Um, I, follow, I, I buy supplements hmm. and follow um, this woman, Olivia. She's got a supplement business called Organic Olivia. Okay, we buy. Yeah. She's, an, she's like an herbalist. And she, she has a couple hundred thousand followers on Instagram. She's mm -hmm. got a podcast. She just puts out content and that that is leverage for her to sell her products mm -hmm. without code, without without anything. So it's just amazing to see what is possible by using the new forms of leverage that are available yeah. to everybody. And everyone who's listening to this now, the, the, all the differences with podcasts and what we do and everything is showing up and regularity. This is show number 36. I said at the very beginning, stupidly, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to get to number 50 but because I've said it, I've stuck by it and I've made it part of my fabric. And I think the big thing is, is a lot of this stuff, you're going to be very shitty. I was, if go and watch some of my early videos, I was two stone light then as well, no beard. And I look terrified on camera. It's, awful but i now feel 
relax with it, right? So I always say mm -hmm. to people, anyone can do this. Lee Ran, you can do it. I can do it. Find your medium. Is it voice? Is it the written pen? Is it video? What is your medium? And Go out and do this, you know? Yeah, and if you hate doing it, you know, you can hire somebody else to do it or you yeah. can partner with somebody else who's going to do it. Um, you know, I wouldn't say like, I would say, is it a fear or is it like, right? If it's a fear, then just overcome the fear and do it, hmm. it and you might enjoy it. But if it's something you hate doing, then find some, you know, find something you do enjoy doing hmm. in your business that could be leverage. That could be writing a blog. That could be, right? I mean, it could be doing YouTube videos. It could be doing a podcast. It could be uh, so many, so many different things. It could be growing social media, um, all that. Yeah. So should we, uh, should we get to the next one? Yep. Let's have a look what we've got here. So we've covered product to media, new leverage. We can stay on leverage. It says pick a business model with leverage or we um, could go for let's judgment. Do learn, let's do learn to sell, learn to build. Okay. Got a, we've got to go good. a bit earlier for that. Learn to sell, learn to build. Yeah, got it. Let's do that. Talking about combining skills, you said that you should learn to sell learn to build if you can do both you will be unstoppable you know this is a very broad category now but it's two broad categories one is building the product which is hard and it's multivariate that can include design that can include development that can include manufacturing logistics procurement it could even be designing and operating a service it has many many definitions but in every industry there is a definition of the builder in our tech industry, that's the CTO, is the programmer, is the software engineer, hardware engineer. But, you know, even in like a laundry business, it could be the person who's building the laundry service, who is making the trains run on time, who's making sure all the clothes end up in the right place at the right time and so on. Then the other side of it is the sales side. Again, selling has a very broad definition. Selling doesn't necessarily just mean selling individual customers, but it could mean marketing. It could mean communicating. It could mean recruiting. It could mean raising money. It could mean inspiring people. It could mean doing PR. So it's a broad umbrella category. So generally, the Silicon Valley startup model tends to work best. It's not the only way, but it is probably the most common way. When you have two founders, one of whom is world-class at sales and one of whom is world-class at building. An example is, of course, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak with Apple. Gates and Allen probably had similar responsibility early on with Microsoft. Larry and Sergey, you know, probably broke down along those lines, although it's, it's a little different there because that was a very technical product delivered to end users through a simple interface. But generally, you will see this pattern repeated over and over. There's a builder and there's a seller. There's a CEO and CTO combo. And venture and technology investors are almost trained to look for this combo whenever possible. It's sort of the magic combination. The ultimate is when one individual can do both. That's when you get true superpowers. That's when you get people who can create entire industries. The yeah. So if we're honest with ourselves, we're built yep. we're builders, but they're, they're not on the technical side. We're technical marketers, but we need mm -hmm. Ellis and people like that in our lives that make yeah, the other definitely. side of the work. Yeah. I definitely see myself more as the seller, right? Like yeah. you know, yeah. meaning meaning I can go I can go, I'm, I'm good enough to be able to go find a product, mm -hmm. work with a factory, make some design changes, but I'm not like a designer, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'm not a, I'm not an inventor of a new, of a new product. I'm not coding really anything, but I'm the marketing, right? Yeah. As, which is essentially what it takes to succeed on, mm -hmm. on Amazon at least is the, is the selling and, and marketing part. So it's the listing creation, right? It's going, it's going on and getting, getting the customer to buy that product. Yeah. And I, I feel like that's, um, that's my stronger skill set. But then if, imagine if you partnered with somebody that wasn't a mate, that was a, a product designer, right? That was mm -hmm. a developer, that was an inventor that, that, uh, could really bring stuff and design stuff and develop molds and do all this stuff. And, and there's companies that do this and can help you do that, but that's like, at least for e-commerce, right? That's an awesome partnership. Somebody who can design an amazing product and then somebody who knows how to go sell that product. And it's the same thing for any for any software company, right? Or SaaS, right? You need somebody to do the coding hmm. and then you need someone to know how to do the sales and marketing, right? Like, I mean, somebody at Facebook had to know how to get this out into the world. It wasn't just coding it. There was a, 
must have been a system or plan. I mean, they they first got it into colleges, and then it kind the of campuses took off, but, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Campuses, but somebody had to have a plan. Okay, we need to get this out to all the campuses, to all the colleges, mm -hmm. or um, somebody at Google had to figure out how we're going to go beat Yahoo and Net, mm -hmm. and you know Netscape and these other yeah. older search engines. So, um, and Steve, you know, he's talking about Apple. Steve Jobs was a salesperson, right? Steve Jobs mm -hmm. was the one that got on stage and told you how a computer was beautiful, right? And mm -hmm. it was the first time we kind of heard those like sexy words being used to describe machinery, hardware mm -hmm. yeah. um, of sleek and beautiful. And Steve Jobs did an amazing job selling that, right? Like you would, I mean, who else, who wants to, who wants to tune in to watch a launch of a, of a computer, but the way he, the way he put it out there and how beautiful he made it, he knew how to sell you the product. Yeah. I think it's also imp important with, technical and non-technical founders like what we have with with databrill and yep. what i learned this time around versus the first time around back in 2010 and working at other companies one of the spoils of working with a sales orientated business and engineering is that it would always clash because sales want everything done yesterday engineers need to deliver it but it's hard to articulate that to the sales team the um the personalities are different you might some mm -hmm. more introverted, more out, you know. And so there is always that kind of clash. And all my learnings of working with round engineers and everything else is brought me to today. Is like what I understand from the engineering point of view is that a lot of this algorithmic base and stuff is very, very co um, complex, right? So if yeah. you're going to be like Naval, right, he sits down, he ponders, he thinks about stuff. It's the same with engineers, right? They've got to map all this out in their head and then put it down, and, and they need undivided attention where they can't be disturbed. The last thing they want is to be looking in their inbox and dealing with, say, customers at certain time mm -hmm. because for every time their concentration is broken, they're losing time on writing and code. So they need to get in into like the flow state. And yep. in order to do that is to tune out. And also you want to do that is you don't want to be stressed and everything. So my major role really, uh, our business is like, Ellis, what do you want? What do you need? And then I'll put a, a ring of fire around it and mm -hmm. like go and do what you do and I'll take care right. of the rest. And that's kind of our relationship. I don't get involved in that side of the business. You just say to him, what are your needs? Do we need more hire more staff? Do you need more right. tech, tech on here? Do we need softwares? Tell me what you want. I'll go get it. And and I right. think that's very powerful in when you understand, and that puts ego aside, right? Because sometimes you can go, oh, look, that, that person there, they look really good. And it's not, it's never a competition. It's and about you're balancing. The, you're also the sales side, right? Like yeah, he's yeah, the, yeah. the build side in a sense, right? You're the, yeah. you're the sales side, right? So yeah. it's, a, it's a good combination of what the business needs, right? It needs... Yeah. But neither the, medals, that's the thing. Neither jumps yeah. on. It's like you have your respected departments. It's like, Ellis will let me get on with it. It comes down to trust, no ego, yeah. and all about trust. And I think yeah. that's really key. So that what I'm trying to get to the audience here is they're thinking about developing software and everything. Don't make the mistake of meddling on the engineering side when you don't know anything about it. And like in the Val podcast, we didn't get to that stage. It's easier to be an, an engineer first and then learn sales than it is to learn be a salesperson and learn engineering later on in life because you don't have that time frame right. to get to that level of excellence, you know? Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, you know, I, I guess the one side of it is that as the as the salesperson, you might you might know what you have insight right to the customer, maybe where yeah. versus where you know what the engineers should be working on and doing. But yeah, yeah how to how to actually do the cold coding or how to build it. It's probably not something you should you should meddle in, but you probably have better insight. You're gonna have better insight to the end customer of how oh, yeah. something should look, should look and feel yeah. than the than the engineer coding, right? But that's yeah. where a kind of collaboration needs to come in. But yeah, a strong business is gonna have. You can build. You know, if if Zuckerberg built Facebook, but nobody knew about it, hmm. it wouldn't be Facebook, right? So you need to build and sell. In any in any business, you can have yeah. you can have the best quality freaking product on Amazon, but if it has no reviews and no visibility, yeah, you're never gonna, you're never going to sell it, right? But then again, you could be amazing at sales, but if your product quality sucks, you're yeah. also screwed. And if you look at what we do, our sales is that we're not outbound. I've never picked up the phone in this industry to do cold calling. Have you? No, everything's inbound. So I, what I've never spent I've never spent a dime on on advertising my agency or or yeah. anything. It's all. Yeah. you know, content and word of mouth. 
Yeah, now we, we've been running ads for external of the Amazon community for brands here in the UK. That's a new mm. new way of us working there where I'm not in that world. But like right. you, it's just it's about constant flow of producing the best content you can provide without, you know, these three little tips at the end. And, you know, we don't literally sit here right. and plug, plug the shit out of our agencies. Yeah. People know where to right. find us, right? If yep. they trust our voice, they know what we're into and know what we do. Right. And they'll go, actually, I'm ready to go onto an agency if they're growing. They might have listened to us four years ago. I often right. get it where my clients are from years ago, and I don't even remember answering a Facebook message like with a voice clip. And they'll say, like, I was doing, you know, 50 grand a year, and then now I'm doing 1 million. Now I want to come and speak to you guys because that's where we're at, where we can afford to do an agency, you know. So, yep. And, you know, Danny, I, I, uh, I still get calls. I probably get one, one call a month. Of somebody I sold insurance to like yep. six years ago, seven years ago, and yep. they're like looking for another policy, and they call me, and that's like pretty, pretty. They're annoying phone calls, but it's pretty awesome at the same time. Yeah, yeah, they uh, still remember from you from the work that you did before. Yeah, right. Say, hey, I don't do that anymore, but yeah, developing that trust. Cool. Um, what about? Let's go back up because we've probably got one left to do. Is there anything that? Be too busy for coffee. Keep refining what you do. Escape competition through authenticity. Love this one. You want to go on this? Yeah, sure. This reminds me of your tweet about escaping competition through authenticity. It sounds mm. like part of this is a search for who you are. It's both a search and a recognition. Because sometimes when we search our egos, we want to be something that we aren't. And our friends and family are better at telling us actually who we are or looking back at what we've done is a better indicator of who we are. Peter Thiel talks a lot about how competition is besides the point. It's counterproductive. We're highly mimetic creatures. We copy what everybody else is doing around us. We copy our desires from them. If everyone around me is a great artist. I want to be an artist. If everyone around me is a great business person, I want to be a business person. Everybody around me is a social activist. I want to be a social activist. That's where my self-esteem will come from. You have to be a little careful when you get caught up in these status games that you end up competing over things that aren't worth competing over. So Peter Thiel talks about how he was going to be a law clerk because he was in law school and everybody around him wanted to be a law clerk for a Supreme Court justice or some famous judge. And he got rejected. And that's what made him go into business. So it helped him break out of a lesser game into a greater game. So sometimes you just get trapped in the wrong game because you're competing. And the best way to escape competition, to get away from the specter of competition, which is not just stressful and nerve wracking, but will often drive you to just the wrong answer. The way to escape competition is to just be authentic to yourself. If you are fundamentally building and marketing something that is just an extension of who you are, no one can compete with you on that. Who's going to compete with Joe Rogan or Scott Adams? It's impossible. Is somebody else going to come along and write a better Dilbert? No. Is someone going to compete with Bill Watterson and create a better Calvin and Hobbes? No. They're being authentic. This is easiest to see in art. Artists are, by definition, all naturally authentic. But even entrepreneurs are authentic. Who's going to be Elon Musk? Who's going to be Jack Dorsey? These people are authentic, and the businesses and products that they create are authentic to their desires and their means. If somebody else came along and started launching rockets, I don't think it would phase Elon one bit. He's still going to get to Mars because that's his mission, you know, insane as it seems. Right. Important thing here to point out is that in the world of private labeling, you take a product, you improve on it. So that's difficult in some cases. So you will have competition. Yes. But I do think is how you think about competition. You can, yeah. you can take way too much negative energy and suck the life out of you. But and, you, and you look, kick this off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, are you inserting yourself into the product story, for example, mm. or somebody, right? Like meaning we see this with people in their A plus content, right? They show a picture of their family and the one who started the business and like they're, they're being, they're, they're competing on more than just the product, right? All right. Do you have some, certain like way you want to do customer service or and, and you should be thinking about you know how do i how do i insert authenticity on this which you have limited control on amazon but you have more on off amazon on your social media on the face of the brand on through your website like through your messaging how can you do things that yeah nobody can compete with you because it's not them hmm. um it is it is harder to do with being just an amazon product but there's still things you could do um 
your picture of your family on your A plus content is going to be probably different than your Chinese competitor. Is that enough to win? Probably not, but it but it does it does differentiate your offering maybe from somebody else's offering. Um, yeah. But those are things that you should think about, right? How do I, you know, what is my insert strategy like? How do I insert authenticity more into my product where I'm not competing? Um, I spoke to a seller this week that's in supplements. Okay, and one of the things that they told me is we have U.S. based phone based customer support. And that's one of the things that we do to differentiate our product because you know what, it's hard to differentiate your supplement from somebody else's supplement. So we try to do it in other ways outside of just outside of just the product, like amazing customer service. You know, that's one thing you could do. So um, I think I, I think it's smart to try to think about in any business on how you can how you can differentiate yourself based on you and your business than just like then just doing the exact same thing that the competition is doing. Yeah, without a doubt. Cool. Let's wrap there. Just give you a rundown what's happening this week, and then we'll pass back to you, Liran. So tomorrow we've got product selection in and around the COVID-19. Kian's back with Sharon Evans. Thanks. Tuesday, we uh, I still got to get that booked in, but Wednesday, Liran's back. Failed products, funny stories, part two. So it's Tim Jordan, Liran, Norman Ferrer. Thursday will be part three of our Shopify show off Amazon uh, with Myros and Joe will return. Awesomers versus Seller Sessions is on Friday, then Women on Amazon on Saturday, and then again, Lee Rand and I will return for Mindset Sunday. I'll update in during the week some of the subject matters that are missing. I'll have a chat with you, of course, about what you want to do next week. Yeah. Um, anything you want to quickly say before we go? Um, no, but again, I'll say, like I said in the beginning of the show, um, if you have not listened to Joe Rogan with Naval, uh, go, go watch that, go watch that, uh, that YouTube, uh, that YouTube video. Uh, it's really good. Cool. And if you want to reach Lee Rand, just hit you up on Facebook. Yeah. Yep. Sounds, Sounds good. good. Guys, going to love and leave you. Stay home, stay safe. See you tomorrow. 4 PM UK. Take care. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.